Minsk, April 26, Institute of Nuclear Energy. Alyana worked hard and fell asleep right at work, in the morning she was woken up by a colleague. It was Saturday, so almost none of the staff of the department came. Suddenly the Geiger counter detected elevated radiation levels. Alyana took a sample of dust from the glass and closed the window. The instrument showed that it was iodine-131, which is a decay product of uranium-235. So the cause of the leak was reactor fuel. Alyana tried to find out what was wrong, but everyone was on edge. After taking iodine pills, Alyana told her colleague to do the same. Meanwhile, in Pripyat, doctors were taking radiation victims. There weren't enough IVs for everyone. Engineers and firefighters received terrible burns, the medical staff bravely did their job. Crowds of people gathered outside. Ludmila and everyone else tried to find out what had happened to their relatives. Ludmila managed to break into the hospital after all. The medics piled all the radiation-contaminated clothes into a pile. Professor Valery Legasov is waiting to be invited into the office. For now he decided to read the report of Deputy Chairman Sturbina. What he read made him very nervous. Finally, the secretary asked him to follow her. Here is General Secretary Gorbachev and other high-ranking officials. Boris Sherbina was the first one to speak. According to him, the situation in Chernobyl is stable, the director of the nuclear power plant Bryukhanov keeps everything under control. Gorbachev was about to finish the meeting, but suddenly Legasov announced that the situation was in fact critical. The report says that there are pieces of black smooth mineral lying around the exploded power unit. This is probably graphite. This means only one thing. The reactor core exploded. Sherbina believes these concerns are groundless, but Legasov disagrees. Bryukhanov told them about the radiation level of 3.5 Ronchin, but the thing is that for standard dosimeters, this is the maximum value. Most likely, the real number is much higher. None of the meeting members were convinced, but Gorbachev agreed to listen to the professor. Trying to calm down, Legasov told what the real situation could be. If the wind blew radiation all over the continent, it would be a catastrophe. Gorbachev ordered Sherbina to go to Chernobyl and personally inspect the reactor. Sherbina was not thrilled that he had to go along with Legasov, but he could not argue with the order. They boarded the helicopter. Sherbina ordered Legasov to tell them how an atomic reactor worked. The professor tried to explain the principle of its operation in accessible language. He also told that graphite rods are needed to control a nuclear reaction. Sherbina said that he didn't need the professor anymore. In a panic, Ludmila tried to find her husband, and the hospital was in total chaos. The neighbor Mikhail, who had received radioactive burns on the bridge, begged to take his small child, but the doctor told the woman to move away from them. Ludmila asked the receptionist for help, where she was told that Vasily was going to be transported by helicopter to Moscow to hospital number 6. Ludmila can't go after him, because no one is allowed out of Pripyat. Major Burov advised her to tell them his name and surname at the checkpoint, and then they would let her out for sure. Vasily and other numerous victims were carried on stretchers to the helicopters. Meanwhile, Legasov and Sherbina arrived at Chernobyl. The professor immediately noticed the graphite on the roof in the open reactor core. Sherbina wanted to fly right over the building to see everything for himself. Legasov began shouting that if they did that, they would die in a week, but Sherbina was adamant. Then Legasov turned to the pilot, who was frightened and disobeyed Sherbina's order. Alyana Komyuk met with the deputy secretary. She was interested in what happened in Chernobyl. She also advised to urgently evacuate the city. However, the deputy secretary was unconvinced by her arguments. Leaving, Alyana gave the secretary iodine in pills, which would allow her thyroid not to absorb the radiation. Bryukhanov and Fomin watched the military eliminate the aftermath of the explosion. They were to have a conversation with Sherbina, whom they consider a stupid and stubborn bureaucrat. The director gave Boris a list of people he thinks were involved in the accident. Fomin began to convince Legasov that the core could not have exploded. Suddenly Sherbina asked why the graphite was lying on the reactor roof. Bryukhanov and Fomin did not expect such a question and were confused. General Pikolov reported that a high-power dosimeter was brought in. One could cover the car with lead, put the dosimeter on the hood, and penetrate deep into the nuclear plant to find out the real level of radiation. Pigolov volunteered to carry it out himself. So they did. Pigolov was outfitted in the strongest protective suit possible. He drove straight to the nuclear plant, while Sherbina, Legasov, and the others were nervous, waiting for news. At one point a soldier entered and reported that Pigolov had returned. He and the car were thoroughly disinfected. Pikolov reported that the radiation level was 15,000 X-rays. 
This is twice as much as in an atomic bomb explosion. This means only one thing. The reactor core is open. Sherbina ordered to take Ryukinov and Fomin to the party headquarters. It will not be possible to put out the fire at the reactor with water because the temperature exceeds 2000 degrees, which means that the water will evaporate. Legasov suggested that the reactor should be covered with sand and boron, but helicopters should not fly over the core in any case. It is urgent to evacuate Pripyat, but Sherbina can't do it yet, as there has been no order from above. Legasov went to the hotel, where he drank vodka at the bar, which also absorbs radiation. Other guests asked if they should be worried about the incident at the nuclear plant. Legasov had to lie that everything was in order. 27th of April. Helicopters arrived with the first shipments of sand and boron. The pilots had been ordered not to fly directly over the core, but one of the pilots violated the boundary. The radiation knocked out all the electronics, and the helicopter crashed. Unfortunately, there is no other way to eliminate the consequences of the explosion. Alyana Hamuk called the Kurchatov Institute. A former colleague, using their individual cipher, tried to briefly outline the situation. Alyana guessed that they were dumping sand and boron on the fire. She intended to go to Chernobyl. Sherbina was satisfied that everything went relatively well. Legasov was still concerned about the fact that the city had not been evacuated. When the professor announced that each of them would have no more than five years to live, Sherbina was shocked. Suddenly the phone rang. Boris was told that they had heard about the incident abroad. The whole world already knows about the horrors that have happened here. The residents of Pripyat began to evacuate in an emergency. Military trucks with horns drove through the city, announcing that all citizens had to leave the city immediately. Under the supervision of the military and the police, the people were seated in buses. Everyone was very frightened and worried, although the authorities claimed that everyone would be able to return to their homes in a few days. Alyana was stopped at the checkpoint at the entrance to Chernobyl. She explained that she was an employee of the Belarusian Energy Institute and wanted to talk to the most important person. Legasov was explaining how they should proceed. Suddenly Pikolov brought Hamiak, who had been arrested near the southern checkpoint. She said it was not very smart to dump boron and sand on the reactor core. It will be melted down sooner than they thought. It will happen because the water tanks are full, not empty, as the staff claimed. The news was broadcasting about the accident. Gorbachev again convened a meeting, at which Hamuk was present. Sherbina asked Legasov to address. They must prevent by all means the melting of the water tanks, which could provoke a massive thermal explosion. Alyana said that the shock wave would destroy all life within a radius of 200 kilometers. The remaining areas will be contaminated with radiation. Belarus and Ukraine could become uninhabitable for at least a hundred years. Legasov suggested a possible solution to pump water out of the tanks. Unfortunately, it can only be opened manually. This requires three volunteers who know the nuclear power plant well. Each of these volunteers would receive radiation incompatible with life. Gorbachev gave his permission for this. Pribyut was completely deserted, as if there had never been people here. Legasov told the engineers about the task at hand, promising that each of the volunteers would be greatly rewarded. But everyone is well aware that this is tantamount to death. Legasov was taken aback, and then Sherbina took the floor, saying that it was their duty to the country. The volunteers were found quickly. They were outfitted in chemical protective suits, and Legasov watched from the car. The volunteers went to the tanks, walking through radioactive water. They were aware that they would not live more than a week afterwards. But no matter what, the engineers were ready to bravely do their duty. Soon the flashlight stopped working because of the radiation, and the men were left in complete darkness.